wanted to talk about different roles of, of women and different perceptions of women. Um, I don't know if it happened here, but it certainly happened in New York. There was a period of time when black men were walking around with t-shirts with all kinds of references to bitches on them. And so I, I wanted to bring that up and say, and kind of jump from yesterday and the role that women wanted to uh, inhabit to today and some of the roles that women are perhaps pushed into. Um, and I also ask the question here, do we wear our disdain on our chests? Is self-hatred projected outwards into an aesthetic statement? So I leave you to think about that. Um, the next one, I'm going way back. I'm going way, way back. I'm going to the 18th century. I'm going to um, around the time of the American Revolution. I'm going to um, a period when there were lots and lots of runaway slaves and they were advertised for return in the newspapers. If you go into the, if you look, you can go online and find loads and loads and loads of these ads. And some of them really are fascinating because when you look at them, you find that there were slaves that spoke French, that spoke German, that spoke Dutch. But what is particular about most of the ads and why I chose to include them here is because the slaves are identified by their clothing. The clothing is an index of who they are. So here it says, um, and, and a lot of them are very fashionable. Listen to this. He had a butternut colored coat, a felt hat, a toe cloth trousers. And, and then, of course, you know, some of the punishment that he had to endure. He has part of his right ear cut off and a mark on the back side of his right hand. So we know that. More than likely, he had tried to run away before, or he'd, he'd run into some difficulty with his master, and he wore that. Not only did he wear his identity in his cloth, he also wore that identity in the violence that he sustained on his body. But there, there are loads, and I mean, there, there are reams and reams and reams of these runaway ads uh, if you go online. But I just wanted to give you one of them because when you look at that material, you see that it was through their clothes that they were known. And very often what they would do is they would put on all kinds of stuff. Sometimes they would put on everything they owned, and then they would change it, because that was how they could be caught. So they would put on other clothes. So that, you know, they were, they were ingenious at that point. Um, as part of the course that I took, uh, that I taught, one of the things that I learned that fascinated me extraordinarily was the geography of the plantation. Um, the plantation was very much like a rectangle, if you do like a cartographic map. And the, um, the master had this panopticon view. He wanted to be able to control the plantation 24-7 and to order what each slave was doing at every point. But you can't control everything. So the slaves found that they could control the edges. There were places, it's kind of like blind sight. You know, there were places that he couldn't see, crevices into which he couldn't get. And so that's where they located themselves. And they had clandestine parties on the edges of plant, plantations. They would plan them for, for months. The women would wear yellow and red shoes. They would make sure that they were dressed in ways diametrically opposed to the hemp and the sturdy labor clothes that they had to wear. They, they would just have great times. They would, they would plan their parties. Um, you know, the women would make the food. Uh, the, the men would play the music. Uh, and they would have these parties like 2, 3 in the morning. Um, so it was their way. They chose their leisure and their clothes <coughs> as ways to express their humanity and to fight back and say, you're not taking everything from me. I still got something. Um, another thing that I learned while teaching this course was that the aesthetic was very different. The European aesthetic tends to be kind of a, um, you know, you, well, I'm kind of dressed in it. You like, <laughs> no, you, you like, you like, you like, like one
one color, you know, primarily. You know, you don't want a lot of distraction. You, you know, you're focused. The African eye and aesthetic liked a lot of talk, liked a lot of communication between patterns, would bring everything together and, and just feel like there's life there. It was as though the, the European aesthetic, in a way, was almost the draining away of excess pattern. And the African aesthetic was the pulling together of all of these differences so that there was a dialogue, a cultural dialogue. And there was the unexpected. They enjoyed the unexpected. Um, and so a, a lot of the times, they would create their clothing uh, for example, if they were given um, material, they would uh, layer the material so that it could be warmer. Or if they had material from a favorite aunt, they would add that. So they weren't afraid to just to bring things together. And we see that a lot in kind of the aesthetic of the quilt. We've heard a lot about the aesthetic of the quilt. And one of the things, I don't know if this is written anywhere, but one of the things that I'm coming to think about is the value of the strip. When you think about Jewish history and ghettos, um, and you go back to the Middle Ages, that the Jewish people were only allowed to um, cultivate their crops in strips, narrow uh, selvages along the edges. And it's almost as though that, that a similar, it's not the same, but a similar kind of thinking operated in our history in that if we go back to that plantation geography that I was talking about, we didn't have the whole plantation. We had strips, but we used the hell out of those strips. And I think that kind of this strip works its way into the patchwork. Um, I wrote something here, uh, the next one, and I'll read it, but I'll talk a little bit about it. <coughs> We've long known that slaves were economizers. They used what they had to get what they wanted. Theirs was an aesthetic that took the givens and used limitation to advantage. The quilt is a prime example of this approach. To protect themselves from the cold and to serve other purposes, slaves would save the good pieces from the clothes and other household materials at their disposal. They would cut away the worn when they weren't able to mend and darn it into continued existence. The salvage pieces would be sewn together into a hole, given a backing and reinforced. Sometimes the constructed hole would tell a story, hold close a memory of good times or of trials or become a sign for others to follow. For example, a quilt was sometimes hung on a clothesline outside a safe house where runaway slaves could find refuge and refreshment on their journey north to freedom. So they, they use these quilts for multiple purposes. I thought of this because when I was a little girl, my grandmother made quilts, and that's what she did. She would save the pieces of fabric from, from whatever. You know, it could have been a dress that she had. It could have been a tablecloth. It could have been part of a sock that, um, her mother had made, but she, she wove it all together and created a totality out of those pieces. And I think that's part of our genius. You talked about use and reuse. So it's that use and reuse. You also talked about ownership. And I think that that fits in very well here because these were people who knew that they owned very little. They couldn't even claim to own themselves. But they resisted that denial of ownership by owning what time they could piece together, by owning whatever remnants of whatever was at their disposal. So they created wholeness out of pieces. Uh, the next image, um, I move into a quilt, and I move back into today. And this, this is a piece of quilt art that Kate comes from Faith Rheingold who was born, I believe she's, she's still alive, she was born in the 30s, and she's one of the major quilt artists of today. I like this particular one for two reasons. One, because it shows a combination, a combo, which I think reflects some of what I was talking about 
in that our genius is a genius of collaboration and combination, but there's also the individual out front. And in this case, it's a woman. She's got her arms out and she can embrace the world. And for me, that's really exciting because if you go back through kind of the history that I've traced, you also see uh, on the edges, perhaps, the emergence of the woman. Because what slavery did is that it, it if there's such a word, it under, ungenderized us as a people. What I mean by that is that gender differentiates. It, 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 sets, it says, you can do this because you, for whatever reason, let's say you're stronger, so you can, you can tote that barge. You, as a woman, you may not quite be so physically strong, so you can stay in the house and do X, Y, you know, you can cook the food, and you can wait for the man to return. <laughs> Slavery atomized the genders. So there were women who were out in the field doing the same work. Well, you've heard, aren't, ain't I a woman too? Slavery denied gender. And so, so women had that double burden. And some people would say it unburdened them. In other ways, it, it reburdened them. Uh, they had to work up into humanity and into their position as women. So that, that's what I mean where, where the slavery ungendered. Um, yeah, it, it flattened. It flattened the relationship between men and women. And I, I think to some extent we are probably still experiencing some of that now. Um, so um, anyway, I, I wanted, I see this as, for me this is an image of exaltation. It's an image of embracing the world <coughs> and having come through trials and being able to share something important with the world. Something colorful, something vibrant, something alive. Here I talk about Faith Reingold and uh, how she has taken fabric art to a new expressive level. Um, and I see, uh, I was talking about this, this talk of mine to a friend and she said, ah, Quilting is visual jazz, and it is. That the same idea of use and reuse, combination, the solo, the individual having his or her time, but the group always coming in and providing solidarity and solace and connection. And so we see that aesthetic, our aesthetic. We see it in the art of fabric and we see it in the art of music, and we see it also in the art of improv improvisation, and we also see it, I believe, in the art of syncopation, which takes the, in a way, syncopation is like what we do with our fabric. Syncopation, when music comes in regular, kind of European music comes in regular beats, you know, one, two, three, four, and that's, you know, that's when you hit it on, on the, you hit it on the bar, on the regularity, on the order. Syncopation splits that. It, it, it changes the, it, it atomizes time. And in that atomization of time, you hear other beats and other voices. So there's a multiplicity. I think maybe that's an important word. There's a multiplicity in the African inflected aesthetic. 